Just give us a brief background of yourself. How did you get into crypto and end up in Rarible? I'm Lian. I'm usually based in Toronto. My background is in industrial engineering. That's what I kind of went to school into. But I got down the crypto rabbit hole in 2016. It's like, me, Lian, you should buy this ETH. It's like, cool, what's the stock ticker symbol? He's like, no, no, you need a wallet. Little did I know. I'm like, you know what? I have a wallet. He's like, no, it's like a crypto wallet. Anyways, long story short, somehow ended up down the ETH rabbit hole. Eventually, the I pivoted into working in Web3 and Terrible, which is exciting. I started my career in advertising. I then sort of hopped around, bopped around, and then I went over to Twitter, which was an amazing experience. I was introduced to NFTs probably like 2020, and I was like, whoa, like, I was like, wow, these NFTs, there's something on the blockchain. I need to figure this out. And so after working on these projects, I was like, wow, this is something that I think is going to be the next big thing. And so I was introduced to Rarible. Another fantastic episode on the show today, and actually a first. Uh, we get to talk with uh, some team members over at an NFT marketplace, uh, a semi-OG one, actually, in fact, uh, none other than Rarible, which introduced uh, some of the first ever tokenomics into an NFT marketplace. I'm here with Adam Alanich, the head of the community at Rarible, and Lean Altaher, who is the product manager. Oh my God, we are in for a great episode uh first adam and lean thank you for for joining for joining us on this episode absolutely thanks for having us yeah as we were discussing before uh and of course i didn't think about this of uh both of you are located in much different areas across the world which is a different area for me so we're all on different time zones but that's kind of the power of of crypto right and and working in these uh decentralized workplaces. Uh, I'll start with, with Lean first. Uh, just give us a brief background of, of, of yourself. How did you get into to crypto and end up in at Rarible? Awesome, sounds good. GM, GM, super pumped to be here. Um, I'm Lian. I'm usually based in Toronto and Lisbon right now. Um, my background is in engineering, industrial engineering. That's what I kind of went to school into. Um, but I got down the crypto rabbit hole in 2016. I was at a bar with a friend and they was telling me, Lean, you should buy this ETH. I was like, cool, what's the stock ticker symbol? And he's like, no, no, you need a wallet. Little did I know, I'm like, you know what? I have a wallet. We don't need a wallet. And I just pulled up my physical. He's like, no, it's like a crypto wallet. Anyways, long story short, somehow ended up down the ETH rabbit hole. Um, and then NFTs, I got into it last year when kind of, I think it was like the crazy run that was happening with people, sales, apes, world of women, uh, just went down the, that rabbit hole, loved the space and eventually did the, I pivoted into working in Web3 into Rarible, which is exciting. So you've been at Rarible for about a little over a year? It's actually been six months, Six months. but so. I've been down the NFT journey for around a year. So my DGen alter ego NFT lean started around a year ago. Uh, we all, we all have those alter egos. Uh, how about you, Adam? Yeah, well, I started my career in advertising, traditional digital advertising, and it was cool. It was fun, whatever. Um, I then sort of hopped around, bopped around, um, and then I went over to Twitter, which was an amazing experience. I was there for three and a half years, and I worked on some of the most successful tweets ever sent from Twitter. Uh, I was able to work on the NFT drop. I was able to work on the Hexagon PFP project. And so I was introduced to NFTs probably like 2020, 2021. And I was like, whoa, like, this is cool. And, you know, working at Twitter, you end up getting all of this insight into what people are talking about, you know, whether it's financial markets, macroeconomics, NFTs, um, sports, entertainment, so many different things. But I was like, wow, these NFTs, there's they're something on the blockchain, I need to figure this out. And so it was cool having those work streams where really we had to educate ourselves on like, okay, we see this conversation, this conversation is growing double digits, you know, month over month, year over year, whatever. This is something to pay attention to. And so after, you know, working on these projects, after releasing these products, I was like, wow, this is something that I think is going to be the next big thing. And so I was introduced to Rarible um, and it just so happened that they were looking for someone to lead their community, lead their social. And so, yeah, so I made the jump and I've been here for just under 
a year. It'll be a, a year next month, um, which is an awesome milestone. I know that like even six months can feel like longer than that, can feel like double. So a year almost feels like two, but really grateful to be with Rarible um, and, and just love what they're doing and really appreciate it to you for having us on here. Uh, no, I appreciate it. Yeah, we're all actually uh, freshly newbies to different companies. Uh, I got uh, hired and partnered with Emblem Vault uh, pretty recently. So I started there at November and uh, definitely learning the back end of what it's like to work uh, at a tech company. Uh, I'm sure that you've learned. Uh, Adam, my followers would kill me if I didn't ask you uh, about Twitter since you worked on the NFT side. Uh, for what you can, of course, there's there's so much turmoil within Twitter. I want to kind of stay away from that. Uh, just tell us a little bit about the experience of working on the NFT side um, that, that you could share publicly. Yeah, of course. Like I mentioned when I, I did my intro, like Twitter, at least you know when I was there, um, being on the social marketing team, we were very interested in what people were talking about. I think Twitter is the place where culture unfolds. Uh, Twitter is the place where breaking news unfolds and where people come to just talk more so really than any other platform. Instagram, of course, is very visual. Uh, Facebook, I can't really speak to. Um, TikTok is very like video. Um, so Twitter really is the place where people just talk. And so there's ways internally of tracking, you know, what topics, what keywords, what what things are being talked about. And blockchain and NFTs, we were seeing steady growth in that conversation topic. And so as sort of like the home of culture, as the home of sort of the public square, we always wanted to be self-aware and say, hey, we know what people are talking about. Let's do a marketing activation or let's do let's build products for what matters to people. I mean, you know, not a lot of companies have that data, have that insight. And, and you know, working at Twitter, it just we had that. And so we dropped a uh, NFT series, which was really awesome. Um, they're available on Rarible for anyone who wants to go look. Um, but there were some really cool stories. Those were given out for free, and there was really no expectation that they would like increase in value. But um, I know there's a story of one person in particular who got one of these NFTs. Uh, the NFT went up in value to like maybe 120k at one point, and then she was able to sell this NFT and become the first person in her family to own property. And she bought that house for her parents who were immigrants. So just incredible stories like that, or the hexagon PFP, of course, mm -hmm. a lot of scammers and a lot of people will just put up a JPEG. And so Twitter was like, how can we embrace the fact that the NFT community is on our platform? How can we build a tool for them so that you can show off your verifiable NFT that's, you know, in your wallet on the blockchain. Um, so the team built that and there was a whole host of influencers and projects that we partnered with to get that news out. And now, of course, a lot of people use that on Twitter blue. It's uh, almost like a hallmark. If you don't have the hexagon PFP, it's like a little sus if you do or don't own that NFT. So just really, really exciting work that made me excited about the space and ultimately want, want I wanted to move over uh, to Rarible. Yeah, it sounds like a perfect fit. Uh, the PFP, right, the whole genre was born because of Twitter, at least that's why it was popularized. A little history lesson, uh, one of the earliest PFPs is actually a Twitter eggs collection that exists on Namecoin, which we use on, which we, they use Emblem Vault to, to sell on OpenSea. Uh, and that all, and the reason why it's so popular was because of the egg being the most popular PFP in the Twitter history. So uh, it's a fun, fun history lesson. I was a part of Eggs Down. We actually had bought the uh, Twitter Eggs uh, graphic that was part of that that Twitter collection. So uh, cool how that all comes full circle. Uh, yeah, I think like when you create your Twitter account, or at least this was like way back in the day, your 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 PFP, which I don't even know if people were calling them PFPs back then, <laughs> but it I think by default was some colored egg. Yep. And then, you know, you'd make it your face or your family or your dog or whatever. And then, you know, NFTs came about. So yeah, that egg uh, is sort of like a historic uh, a symbol of Twitter. Also, people love the fail whale, which doesn't exist anymore. But whenever Twitter would be like over capacity or your tweet wouldn't load, uh, the fail whale would pop up, which, you know, people love and miss. My favorite was the Twitter jail, which I used to go put into. I made my Twitter account in 2009. So I've been there for, been on it for, for quite a long time. Rarible is, some, is a platform that uh, kind of kickstarted the rise of 
CryptoPunks. I don't know if people know the history. Uh, when Rarible launched the Rari token, uh, the story is that the the punks community was using wash trading to you know trade back and forth, and then right create the the price or it inflate the price of CryptoPunks and blah blah blah. But Rarible is the first marketplace that I'm aware of that introduced tokenomics to the marketplace, which you see pretty common now with with Uniswap and the DeFi protocols and things like that. Uh, from the product side, it's definitely changed uh, quite a lot uh, since those are like things like late 2019 when it launched. You go to the website now and you see that Rarible's integrated multiple, and I'll pull up the website here in a second. It's integrated multiple blockchains like Immutable and Polygon, a handful of these other ones. Uh, what what is the focus of Rarible right now? There's a lot of competition in the space. There's a million NFT marketplaces. You got to kind of you are they are quote unquote an OG in the space, although it's only been a few years. Uh, what's the kind of discussions like in the focus of Rarible for Lean? I uh, Lean. I think I'm mute. Okay, um, there you go. Great. Here we go. Unmuted. Um, great question in terms of what's the focus now in the space. And there's a lot going on in the space. And kind of what Adam, you were saying about mm -hmm. spending a year at Rarible feels like two. <laughs> Six months for me feels like seven years somehow. Um, what we're focused on is community marketplaces. So it's um, basically if you scroll a bit Oops. down. Sorry. One second. Let's scroll down here in a second. All right. Yeah. I mean, uh, for those that are listening, I'm on Rarible, the marketplace right now. We're on Rarible.com and boom, here we are. So it's a concept where what we're trying to do is we're trying to empower creators, collections to own their own experience, whether it's from a design perspective, royalties, kind of the look and feel. Um, so, for example, what we're seeing right now is the CryptoPunks V1 marketplace, which has actually a very interesting story um <laughs> love the v1 punks iconic iconic project in the space adam and i are always slacking away our faves on the floor with hot picks um but as you can see here this is a storefront that only has the v1 punks collection um you can basically buy list and sell and for this specific project it has a very interesting history. So at one point you were not able to trade it on OpenSea. And that's kind of against the concept of decentralization. We're all here working on a decentralized Web3 future, but really as a project or a creator, you're kind of putting your eggs in one basket when, where you're allowing these big marketplaces to control um, a lot of the kind of whether it's the project sales or and so on. Um, so this has been the focus this quarter for us, which has been exciting. So what I'm looking at right now is a punks marketplace. It's actually at v1punks.io. It's not on Rarible, but this is powered by Rarible. Is that what, what I'm understanding? Bingo. So on the front end, we built it on our side, but it's powered by the Rarible protocol. Mm -hmm. So the contracts it's living on and so on um, is by one of our products, Rarible protocol. But as you can see, the look and feel, you won't see any wearable branding. So unless you've heard that it's been a partnership with wearable or you've entered to it through wearable.com, um, it's just V1 punks and so on. All right, I just pulled up the, the Rect guy one. And so this one's directing me actually to Rect.market. So let's say I'm a new uh, project creator. I have a project. Do I need a dev to help me build this out? Is this a is this along the lines of the, the no-code platforms that we're beginning to, to pop up? What, what does it take for me to take my project and uh, build out a marketplace like this? Great question. So we have two products. One is a marketplace builder, literally no code solution within a couple of clicks, not exaggerating. You can pull up a marketplace. Um, we have it on Ethereum and Polygon, um, and you can see it on rarebuild.com slash community marketplaces. Um, and basically it uses the same concept of what we're seeing on the screen. This was a more of a white glove solution. Um, so it has a bit more customization in it. Um, but it's also going to be hosted on the wearable protocol and we um, will be able to customize it, change colors, fonts, and so on. Aline, uh, uh, how, how long has uh, this protocol uh, 
been up for when did when did rarible launches and is there a fee associated with this uh, of course that's the the royalties and marketplace fees a bit heavy topics probably never going to end uh, tell us a little bit about the yeah the technicals behind it yeah sounds good so the royalties is interesting basically what happens with these community marketplaces is that on ethereum we are aggregating from we're bringing orders from other marketplaces so an example is when you launch a community marketplace, we want to make sure that you have liquidity from day one. So you don't want to have a marketplace that has like no listings and so on. Um, so the orders you see here that says mirrored on them, these are usually aggregated orders. Mm -hmm. So either from OpenSea, Luxrare, X2Y2, Pseudoswap, um, we currently aggregate from four marketplaces. The difficulty happened with us and what we kind of, it was a bit kind of, it was a hard situation we were faced where royalties were no longer respected in a lot of these uh, marketplaces we're aggregating from. But as wearable, we wanted to always push and support artists. So what we did was we built wrappers for certain um, orders. So an example was if we were aggregating an order from Sudaswap, we built a wrapper that at the checkout, if you're buying from a community marketplace, we are enforcing royalties. So we're able to get the percentage, let's say royalties was set at 5%. From the creators, we're able to go ahead, grab that 5% and dump it at checkout. Um, so this has been kind of the, the way we've been looking at royalties. In terms of the fee for the marketplace, there are no marketplace fees from wearable side if you create your own marketplace here. Um, but what's interesting is as a user, you can set your own marketplace fee. Mm -hmm. So, and we've been seeing a lot of cool use cases about it. Um, you can create, let's say, I think Meta Angels, they do that where they take one or 2% and they use it to fund their DAOs, which mm -hmm. could be another cool fun source of revenue for projects and creators. Yeah, here it is. I'm going to pull up the, the Meta Angels one. This solution is uh, definitely something that I would be looking for. I'm 100% a no-coder. I don't know how to code, but I uh, have been using Manifold and some of the other tools out there to really unlock like you know, some of your, your creative spirit um, in, in the space. Adam, how does a Rarible then take this infrastructure you know, that Leanne is working on and try to apply it to a community that sometimes is uh, so locked in on one marketplace, right? Like OpenSea, it's, sometimes it's hard to, to really break, uh, you know, to, to break those routines and to, to attract new users to the platform. Yeah, it's a good question. I think Lean's built something uh, just from the technical perspective that's pretty impressive. I also am a no coder type of person. So as soon as I see like HTML or CSS or like <laughs> back in the day, like MySpace, I don't, there were people who were like coding their MySpace profiles. To, I don't know if I'm dating myself here, but they were like making these like complex, you know, pages. And I'm just like, I don't, I, I can't do it. I can't do it. So I'm really appreciative towards Lean for building this product. And yeah, it's certainly a challenge. I think a lot of people, sometimes even myself, like I'll go to put my hands on the keyboard and my right hand will just type open. And then it populates OpenSea and I'm like, wait, no, no, <laughs> gotta support. So it's just a, it's just a habit that, you know, everyone is into what's been awesome about my role and my work is that I've been able to become sort of friends with communities, community leaders, some of even the NFTs that I hold um, to get in touch with those communities and say, Hey, you know, here's this tool that allows you to control the branding, to control the experience to control to a certain degree the royalties and the fees and you know when you're when you're on like a, a just a general marketplace so let's say you're on rarible or you're on OpenSea or whatever it is there's a lot of noise because there's trending collections there's the top you know 24 per hours there's the top you know 100 collections there's all of these different ways that your attention can be pulled However, when you land in one of these community marketplaces, as you saw, let's say from like Wrecked Guy or V1 Punks, it's just the branding of that collection. And it allows the person to experience the collection within sort of a contained atmosphere, within this sort of like bounded field, if you will, that really is more immersive than just being in a marketplace, a, a general marketplace where there's all sorts of things. There's notifications, there's bids, there's 
there's, you know, trending collections, there's explore, there's all of these things that are fragmenting attention. And we really think that giving power back to the collections to really dictate how people experience their brand, when they experience it, you know, to what degree, you know, royalties and fees um, are structured, all of that stuff. It's giving power back. And we believe in that from a decentralization perspective. Also from a branding perspective, Lean touched on the, the liquidity piece, which is as soon as these are created, we aggregate orders, meaning anyone can go in and buy and sell, even if those orders aren't necessarily fulfilled by Rarible, they're still being fulfilled within the community marketplaces. And so uh, we're just really bullish on all of those uh, aspects of the community marketplaces. Yeah, I, this is probably something that I'm gonna have to look into for some uh, for a project that I'm pursuing. Uh, the, just the ability to go now go mint a, a project and then have a marketplace built through Rarible where I don't have to code anything. Right? That seems like just like a, a dream for somebody who entered this space so early. Like I got in 2016, I've been thinking of millions of ideas, and not until up until recently, I've been able to kind of pursue these. Yeah, absolutely. Another thing that I don't think we've touched on is just like the legitimacy piece of like, there are going to be fake collections uh, around like that just they pop up, you know, scammers are a thing. Unfortunately, I hate to say it. Um, mm -hmm. uh, they're a thing on every platform on every marketplace. Lean knows this I was kicking myself the other day. Um, because I bought a fake checks, you know, the Jack book mm -hmm. butcher collection, I saw one for like 0. 0.12 or something like that. Um, and I was like, Oh, I'm going to go get it. And so I got it. And then I was like, Oh, damn, I, sh I just should have like, you know, <laughs> double checked the contracts But within these community marketplaces, you know, we're really saying that like, this is the OG, the real collection. It's branded exactly the way the collection wants it to be. Um, the, the fees and the royalties are set up exactly the way the collection wants it to. And this is like the one-stop shop essentially for anything that a collection might need. Uh, Lean, I don't know if I'm, I'm jumping the gun here, but you have a pretty exciting update about mm -hmm. multi-collection coming out. If you want to touch on that really quickly, because I think that's a really nice segue into like mm -hmm. what's coming next. And like, what if a collection has more than one sub-collection, you know, it's like, what can we do there? Well, Lean's building that solution right now. That was literally going to be my next question too. So I, we got a podcaster here. I, we, Adam needs to take over the show right now. <laughs> I'm the new host. I'm the new host. I'm sorry. I stole your thunder. Oh, I stole your you're thunder. good. Iconic, Adam. Um, no, that's actually, it's, I, I love that we're vibing. Um, so backstory to that, the first marketplace or one of the first marketplaces that I've worked on that had a lot of collections was Pixel Vault. So Pixel Vault, if you folks know it in the space, an OG project, very cool what they're doing. They have a full ecosystem. That being said, the challenge is they have more than 25 collections. With 25 collections, what Adam was saying, a lot of fakes were circulating. Mm -hmm. It's hard as a team, what's the link tree? You know, How do you direct your community to like all these collections? So as you can see, this is basically a one-stop shop that you'll be able to browse the collections. We work closely with the team. Whenever a new job comes, we're able to kind of add it and so on. Um, but in terms of, so this was a white glove project. In terms of the builder, what we're doing, and it's been the most requested feature on every Twitter DM, every Slack, every Twitter space, our artists, our community, they want to be able to add more than one collection into their marketplace. And it makes sense from every perspective. You know, if you're an artist, you most likely have multiple contracts deployed with multiple collections. And if you're, let's say, a community, a PFP project, you probably have airdrops, you probably have other collections you want to showcase within your ecosystem. Um, so I'm really excited that we're working on this feature. It's going to be shipped in this quarter. Um, and we've been doing this exciting way. In Adam, maybe you can touch about it as well, how we've been like releasing features. We're working on some beta drops uh, we're trying to pre-release certain features to work with the community and our users closer and get feedback before we actually roll it out to public this is uh this is so sleek uh pixel vault's always been quite a confusing project because there is it looks like about 10 to 15 different projects to, to sort of be able to display it and categorize it and organize it uh is more profitable for, for Pixel Vault, but also it's going to be a better experience for the trader or collector to come in and be able to diagnose each NFT and understand uh, 
where its inherent value is and uh, how it's appropriated uh, within the collection itself. Uh, Adam, mm -hmm. did you have something to say or is it Leanne? Yeah, no, I was just uh, gonna ask if you wanna go back to Rarible and click on the MFR. I think it's orange, the mm -hmm. might be one more over. Yep. Yeah, MFRs. So this was one that's, this was an early multi-collection, maybe even the first one that we did. But if you look down there in that second row, you'll see the yep. MFRs, the crazies, and then the end of Sartoshi. Um, which were three collections that are all sort of aggregated within this one marketplace that all sort of funnel back to the MFR ecosystem. And so this was an opportunity for us to engage with the MFR community to hear what they wanted to see. Um, we were actually DMing with Sartoshi before whoever they are disappeared mm -hmm. from Twitter and then they came back. So we're like, you know, still chatting and trying to see, you know, how we can build this out. Um, but yeah, it, it's great because we have close relationships with these collections, with these communities. And so we've released certain things in beta um, just for them to sort of test, to collect feedback, and then Lean publish that, publishes that into a broader release. So from the community angle, it's been really special to get in the weeds with collections to say, hey, what would it take to you know get your community from maybe OpenSea or LooksRare or whatever over to Rarible, what features would it take? You know, what what insert here would it take? And just to get that feedback, it's been it's been really awesome. This is yeah, this is something I'm gonna have to look into more. Uh, for example, like I work at, at Emblem Vault, and so we we basically bring non ETH NFTs to ETH. And so the issue with the R marketplace is that it's similar to the early art blocks where you, we have about twenty different collections on one page. Um, so ha having something like this could, uh, could help that, uh, infinitely. Jake, you've got two people on the call right now who might be able to get you into the multi-collection beta. Mm -hmm. So, you know, be nice to us. In this interview, <laughs> I think you've got, you've got a slot. Yeah. Yeah, man. We're, we'll definitely have to talk a little bit more after this. Uh, just, just for some points of clarification, um, for those that aren't aware of variable, right? It has a native token and right here on the, on the front page, it says 0% fees, the aggregation, and there was the part, there's like a rewards tab that talks about listing, uh, incentives. Can either of you kind of go in and explain, uh, what the reward system is? And also I believe that it is a DAO as well, because it says that there is voting power. So I kind of just like go into those and explain the differences. Yeah. Lean, I can do that unless you want to. Okay, cool. Yeah, Thanks. I got it. Yeah. So as you mentioned earlier on in the interview, uh, Rarible was one of the first, if not the first, mm -hmm. uh, I've only been at the company for a year, um, but I believe Rarible might have been the first. I believe it is the first too. Yeah. To have this sort of like token as an incentive for trading. Now, of course, like the immediate next step for people who are looking for yield is like, great, I'm going to wash trade. Mm -hmm. So that was like very, uh, that's sort of like the most obvious way to utilize any sort of token program. And so a lot of incentive programs now are built in a way that either eliminates the benefit of wash trading or punishes you mm -hmm. for wash trading. Some of it is hard because it's like, how do you attribute the same wallets to one person, especially, you know, if, if they're not docs or if they've never had interactions before, it does get kind of complex. Um, but a lot of reward systems now are just structured in a way that really minimizes the risk of wash trading. So Back in, I want to say maybe December, maybe January, uh, Rarible brought back its token program with a couple different ways to earn rewards. Uh, there were listing rewards um, where, you know, within a certain collection, if you, you know, listed within a certain uh, percentage of the floor price, so the closer to the floor, the, the more mm -hmm. rewards you would get. And that was, of course, just to encourage um, action on the platform to encourage, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Um, some, some people to bring liquidity into the platform. And then there were also buying rewards as well, where you would get your, uh, royalties for, you know, whatever collection you bought refunded to you through, you know, the token program. So we had that going for, I want to say maybe six weeks, maybe eight weeks. Um, and we've recently, uh, ended that program just to sort of get some feedback, to look at our own numbers, to see how it performed. Um, we did get some pretty important feedback just around the listing rewards, which were that in certain cases, 
for certain collections, the listing rewards did in fact drive the floor price down. People were undercutting each other. And, you know, while some could argue that that is good for us because we're making more sales, we're also here for the broader NFT community and for early projects that, you know, don't want their floors being cannibalized, this type of program may not work for them. So that's absolutely feedback that we heard um, and feedback that we're implementing as we revisit our tokenomics for the next token program. But at least uh, to answer your second question, um, we do have the Rarible Foundation, which is sort of like our version of the DAO, which ultimately governs the protocol that Lean was mentioning earlier that these community marketplaces are um, powered by. And so by, by locking 100 Rary within our contract, you actually then do get some voting power. And that was where you saw that 0% fees on the Rarible homepage. If you lock 100 Rary, that gives you 0% fees um, on the uh, on the marketplace side. So other other places like OpenSea, for example, has 2.5% for their fee on every transaction. If you lock 100 Rary, that turns into 0% fees. So it's a way of giving people governance, but then also allowing them to potentially buy uh, for less. So that's uh, sort of the, the existence of the token program right now. The second iteration that I was talking about is not live. Um, that's something that's governed by the protocol. So, you know, that will ultimately become a proposal uh, and that will be voted on and then it will be dispersed. But um, yeah, that's sort of the, the history and the latest thinking around the token program. Tokenomics are really a, a tough thing to implement. I believe LooksRare had a similar issue as well. Of course, with the wash trading was very uh, out in the open, but also they have like a listing rewards thing too and really drives down the price. But if you're going to be a platform that's going to support communities, no one's going to create a marketplace if their floor is just completely obliterated. It doesn't, it does not absolutely make sense at all. Uh, so outside of the platform though, and now, now I'm on the Twitter, how would you describe like the community that supports Rarible? Is it, is it essentially uh, a trading community? Is it a collector's community? Is it a creator's community? Uh, how would you describe it? And what type of approach does Rarible take to engaging with their community outside of token incentives? It's a good question. I would say we sort of have a little bit of everything. So we have a lot of artists who started on Rarible because back in the day, there were other platforms that were essentially like gated platforms. Um, even some now that are gated for, you know, you have to apply to be on their platform and to mint work and to sort of be supported by that platform. Well, Rarible was like, well, wait, that's not right. So Rarible invested early on in minting capabilities, including including lazy minting, um, which is still something that you can do on the platform, meaning that the buyer ultimately pays the gas to mint the NFT. Um, and so we wanted to have artists, you know, come and create their work and, and just to see, you know, what these NFTs could do in this space really quite exciting so that we definitely have like og artists that are still with us that we still support now um we absolutely have some like whales and some traders like i was mentioning with the 100 rary lock like that right now is not a lot of money in like eth terms so like rary is trading for about two dollars maybe 250 mm -hmm. so multiply that by 100 you're looking at 200 dollars 250 for 0% fees, where on one NFT that you buy and that 2.5% you might pay to OpenSea, you might be saving $250 on one buy. You know what I mean? Making that ultimately worth it. So we do have a, a serious trader community that's taking a look at that, and they're actually saving money by you know doing that. You also then have the the early collectors too, um, who were doing you know the the I hate to say it, but yeah, they were absolutely wash <laughs> trading. But you know, it was sort of like the joke or the thing at the time, which is like go to Rarible, trade a bunch, get the tokens, and then you know make money. So we absolutely see all of those people, even sort of in our back end analytics when we look at like what's the behavior. We see a lot of we see a lot of those people. I would say on Twitter. Uh, one of the things that I've gotten really excited about during the bear market is just the rise of, of sort of like memes and shit posting. I hate to say it, but like during the bear market, which, you know, arguably we're still in, but we were in worse, like maybe like three months ago, five months ago, like tweeting GM, everyone's going to make it was not resonating. 
versus during the bull run when everyone was rich and like, you know, everything was going up and we had this, you know, huge bubble. That was the content. That was what everyone wanted to see. Everyone's to the moon. Everyone's a future billionaire. Everyone's, you know, going to make it. Now, during the bear, people want to laugh. People want to smile and people want to feel connected to something larger than themselves. So we've seen just our content turn more towards that like degen shit posting meme type content. And people are loving that, which is great. Yeah, I've been all all aboard the fake memes train and the rare pepes and all this stuff. Tokenized memes. I actually have been on like a bunch of calls this week or space is just talking about how this like meme narrative is uh, probably going to be like the, the PFPs of 2023. So you just got to really be ahead of this trade. This, this place, this place moves so incredibly fast. We're all in yeah. different. Yeah. We're all in different time zones. Uh, tell us a little bit about the company culture of rareable you're decentralized. Uh, a lot of people that listen to this and that I communicate with, they're always trying to find new jobs in the NFT space and trying to understand just what it's like to work for an NFT company. Uh, we'll start with like Leanne first, just tell us a little bit about the experience here and, and like what it's like to work for an NFT company. That sounds good. And that is a question I get a lot, especially from my friends that are still in Web2, um, doing kind of the pivot. I used to work in a massive telecom company in Toronto, um, a lot slower the pace. You know, we used to work telecom app development. That was like the fastest team in the company, but it was still a 50,000 employee kind of ship, right? So to get anything done, you had to get a thousand approvals. It's We were slow. Um, jumping into Web3, I think it's been super fun how fast the space moves. So it's you kind of always have to stay on your feet. You always kind of, and I see it a lot with us at Rarible. It's like you do pre-plan your quarter, your year, but things change, you know. It's like the maybe a chain is no longer relevant or we're switching kind of what the community wants. Um, so it's been very fun how fast we're able to pivot, um, being in a lot of different time zones also it's in a way it's it's kind of like the team never sleeps you always have someone on slack someone shipping someone messaging right um and it's interesting when i'm in toronto working est hours 8 30 a.m i wake up kid you not the amount of messages i have on slack is bananas because a lot of my development team is based in europe um so by the time i'm up a lot of folks already had like half a day go by right so you, there's like a lot of action that went in and it's like you're playing catch up um but that's kind of how it's been going so far in terms of the culture i'd say it's fun um it's exciting i love working with adam and it's i think it's fun for me to be able to work with folks that we can share kind of the hottest projects what's going on you know these were things i would share with my twitter friends in the past and now i'm like it's exciting we work in it um that's kind of, I'd say, the fun part of it. The not so fun part of it is that the fact that it does move super fast when you are working in product and engineering. And so, Adam, 100% on your side as well. Um, it's it's hard to pre-plan your work, right? So a lot of times you work on either features or you work on certain releases that are no longer kind of relevant by the time you ship them. Uh, so we've been really looking into and we've been shipping smaller and faster. And this is where kind of a lot of the beta comes in, a lot of like, okay, let's ship it, see if it works, people like it, and then we can like spend more time on it, um, which has been cool to see. That's incredible. Yeah, the engineering space is uh, on the side of that. It's it's tough to keep up with. Uh, something with, yeah. with Emblem Vault it, that's interesting since I've been there now, uh, probably a little over three months. The product and the team's been around since 2016. So now there's like two conflictions between the early community who thought that the tools and used for DeFi and then the actual practical community that's where the, where the uh, revenue comes from is the NFT community. So you see these conflictions and they still want these like DeFi tools, although it's not relevant as much anymore because as you know, you work for an NFT company. Uh, most of us believe that NFTs are pretty much going to be the future. It's the way to onboard the mainstream, right? The masses, I think, is going to be the the, the correct way. Not uh, uh, leveraging a, uh, perpetuals, right, on like some sort of decentralized protocol and and all the different financial engineering that happens as well. Uh, Adam, how about your side? Uh, keeping up with the community, I know uh, internally uh, and externally, and the culture on both sides can clash. They can also be very similar. Uh, tell tell us about your side of it. 
Yeah, I would say internally, it's very similar to Lean, at least on the marketing side, I ultimately sit within like our marketing division. Uh, we have people all over the world, which is fantastic for a number of reasons. We have different, pers we have global perspectives. I mean, of course, like, I live in New York. I have, you know, sort of like a, I have a certain perspective, right? Someone who lives in Europe, someone who lives in Asia, someone who lives in Australia, someone who lives somewhere else is going to be able to say like, hey, I don't think that language or that term, or I don't think this direction is going to resonate with this market. Why don't we, you know, go this direction? And so you get this like collaborative energy from people who have different perspectives and ultimately like we work it out so that the best ideas uh, rise to the top and ultimately win. And so I feel really lucky to work on a decentralized team with people all over the world. It's awesome. Uh, I would say with the community, like Lean was saying, it can be tough uh, because the, com the, the internet is 24 seven and the blockchain never stops. Unlike traditional financial markets, right? They open, they close, you know, maybe there's like futures trading, maybe, maybe there's like other things that can happen off the clock, but Twitter never stops. NFTs never stop. ETH, the market, Bitcoin, the market, they, I wake up and sometimes there's been like, you know, 5% price action. And it, it's, it's, it's impossible to keep a, like your finger on the pulse of all of it. What I would say is an asset is, you know, coming from Twitter and falling in love with Twitter. I love to be on Twitter and be interacting with people from the Rarible account, from my personal account. I've also started pulling lean into Twitter more like from the Rarible account. I'll be like, let at NFT lean know if you have any questions. <laughs> and she's been amazing because the community now sees her as a leader. They can DM her and say, hey, I'm having this issue. She can log the issue. She can, you know, deploy a, a patch and it can be solved and we can, you know, bypass tickets and, you know, complex systems that might you know, hinder that ability uh, to be agile. And so all of that to say, it's tough to keep your finger on exactly every single re reply or tweet, but I love it. And uh, the Rarible community is super active in, in giving us feedback and hanging out with us. Uh, so it's it's really a pleasure. Yeah, keeping up the community is definitely tough. Uh, just from from looking outside, how, how big is the, is the team at Rarible? Do you know like a, an estimate of how many people work for the company? I don't know the final number. I would, Lean, do you know the final number? I think we're between 40 to 50. That's much larger no, than I anticipated. Like do you think, Adam, where I think we're yeah. in that ballpark, maybe 45? I don't know. And, do, <laughs> and does, does Rebel have any other, any other arms? Do they have like a venture arm? Do they have an investment studio? Do they have, um, have they any other plays or they're just purely focused on the marketplace? Yeah, I would say that the largest teams are like the dev side, and then you have the marketing side, which is inclusive of like content, artist relations, social, those types of things, but no. Um, and then you have sort of like the the protocol and the DAO, which are like technically separate entities, um, but still there, you know, there are some functions that we that we do together. Interesting. Yeah, the, the NFT marketplace, I don't even think I showed you guys this. I don't know if you've seen it yet. Uh, when I did some some research on this stuff, I came through uh, quite a lot of uh, interesting prospects. Here, let me find it real quick. So here's the the NFT marketplace. So this took me legit probably about 30 hours to do between looking through all the history and uh, if you in the in the medium post, there's more details, but you could kind of see from these different blockchains, right? It's kind of so the orange is Bitcoin. This is Namecoin, this is Doge, Dogecoin, and then uh, Ethereum. You see a lot of it's kind of focused on these protocols, which people uh, or these companies were more focused on authentic uh, authenticating assets. And then in 2015 is really where people are like, oh, wow, we can now start selling these authenticated assets on a blockchain purchasable in digital currency. And then you see Rarible all the way, all the way down here, right? So you had, it was like individual marketplaces for these each collections. And then you had OpenSea who was like, oh crap, we could just create like a, a Walmart and just package and sell all of them at one place. Then you have the arts and then you had Rarible who is the first one to utilize a tokenized system. And then shortly after you saw NFTX did a token uh, system and then PseudoSwap and then looks rare and then right and then blur and all these other uh, marketplaces that that come afterwards. 
Does the does the team at Rare Bowl, do you ever uh, look into other uh, marketplaces as as you have to watch your competition, see the other things that we do? How is how is that inv- evaluated? I guess either individually or or as a team. How how what is that type of approach? Yeah, I would say on my side, uh, I have someone on my team. His name is Six, and he is our product marketing manager. And so part of his role is to constantly be scoping our competitors and to see like, where are we being competitive? Where are we at parity? Where are we potentially lagging? Um, just to see, you know, cause this industry is changing so fast. Things are built and deployed overnight. Like it really, really is kind of insane. And so part of his job is just to sort of sit on top of that from the marketing perspective and to see how we can, you know, market ourselves with either narratives or products. Um, one, a good example of that is our pin tweet on our Twitter, which is our, our stance on royalties. Mm-hmm. So yeah, you can see yeah the thread right there. Um, I had to fight to get that image. They were like, no, <laughs> this is serious. And I was like, no, like it is serious, but we need to make it something that people will want to read and be accessible. And so this was sort of ultimately the compromise was this like sort of meme type thing. But uh, yeah, so like we had to understand like, what are all of the marketplaces doing? How are they enforcing or not enforcing royalties? And then like, what's our position? And the way that we drafted that thread was with all of that competitive knowledge. And so that, at least from the marketing side is how we handle it. But I'm sure Lean um, from the product side, she has her own process. I love that image, by the way, Adam. So happy it made the cut iconic. That's what I love about Twitter and this face. It's like fun, you know, fun when you can joke about things. It could be serious reading. and funny at the same time. The memetics. Exactly. That's like the most serious topic ever, like royalties, but have fun with it. Um, on the product side, and what I think is cool about working in Web3, what I found versus Web2 is you're a lot closer to your community and your users. So from one stand, like Adam was saying, literally on Twitter, we're DMing with our users on the daily. It's like, hey, what do you think about this feature? Like, hey, do you need like any help with setting up? And then on the other side of it is that our roadmap And I think we really are pushing on having an open roadmap. And what does that mean is, yeah, you do have features and marketplaces we want to work on and develop, but we're always open ears and ready to put in, if Adam comes up and Adam sees in the market that, hey, this feature drive a lot of adoption. And it's been awesome kind of having that collaboration between a lot of different departments within the team itself internally. So whether it's with marketing, whether it's with our BD team, um, comms, it's a kind of better understanding the spectrum, what's happening outside, whether it's with competition, but also with where the community and the user users are going, right? I feel like we're at a stage where, yeah, we can always look at the competition and see what they're doing, but there's so much room for innovation that you can also take a step back and be like, hey, what's what's currently on the market and where are the missing puzzles that we think our users might need? And you can also, you have space to innovate and push features that no one else has worked on. Um, so I think, yeah, I think this is how we've been looking at it. Yeah, very, very fierce competition in an open source uh, network, I guess, just even uh, an economy. It's uh, it's it's pretty, pretty cool. Uh, I guess looking into the future uh, before before we close this up, is there anything else on the horizon that that Rarible is looking at? Not necessarily even has to build any sort of alpha you can share, quote unquote, for for those listeners that maybe can encourage them to, to come over and participate in. Yeah, from the marketing side, uh, just the the tokenomics program that recently ended, um, we're we're in the process of sort of doing a debrief on how that performed, on you know what was the the impact, good or bad. Um, so there will likely be another one um, that will be like voted on. You know, it has to pass governance just because it it you know involves the token. Um, so I would encourage people to sort of just like stay current with our social channels or even hop in our foundation discord if they want to take advantage of um, those token rewards, because essentially it's like free money. Uh, I don't know if I can say that legally, <laughs> but essentially like that's what it, you know, all amounts to. So, um, yeah, I, from my side, I would say that that's probably coming within the next couple of weeks, maybe a couple of months, but probably weeks. So uh, to just encourage everybody, you know, follow Rarible on Twitter hop in um, and and take it take advantage of that program because it's for our community it's for the people who use the platform and it's to their benefit as well yeah yeah absolutely have a alien any any closing remarks anything any any alpha you could share from the product side 
think alpha is <laughs> polygon polygon has been popping um and now you might be able to see some open sea orders coming through which is exciting so basically open sea apis were closed for a while so we were not able to aggregate any orders um but now and this goes back to the whole concept of if you're launching a marketplace you want to have liquidity in it from day one and how can we empower communities to do so? Um, so you might be seeing some open sea orders come through the Polygon. Ooh, interesting. Yeah, the takeover. I guess this leads to one last question. I, I saw Immutable X is integrated into there. Uh, tell us about it, because I don't think it's integrated into any other marketplace outside of GameStop. Uh, tell us w what it is and, and how that's been for, for Rarible up until now. Lean, can you take this one? So neither of us really work on that. Would be more of like our marketplace uh, team, like who's integrated the chains. I don't know, Lean, because you're on the product side, you might have a, more to say. Um, a couple of nuggets. I haven't really worked with any IMX, but what it, what we've been seeing in the space, it's been a lot of gaming okay. um, projects using IMX. Um, but I don't have much nuggets on it, honestly. That was when I, when I was browsing through Rarible a few months ago, doing that that write up, and I saw IMX on there. It's like I, the only other place I'd seen this was was GameStop. So uh, it seems like a good play. I mean, it's pretty much a zero fee marketplace, right? It's an L two scaling solution for marketplace and gaming and all that all that fun stuff. So going out on uh, the innovation curve and exploring. Uh, Adam and Lena, I appreciate you guys, uh, for, for both of you for coming on and doing it, especially across the world and all these different time zones and it takes a, a somewhat difficulty to, to set up. Uh, I'm definitely going to explore that, uh, marketplace and, uh, don't hang up after this so we can talk a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. We really appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Thank you guys for listening and watching. We'll catch you next time.